Straight Shift. With the Car Chick, the podcast that's all about cars, buying, selling, fixing, and driving. And sometimes pretty fast to hear the Car Chick. Now, here she is. Welcome, everyone, to the Straight Shift. Today, we're going to talk about selling your car privately, you know, listing it on the internet and selling it to a, another private individual as opposed to selling it wholesale to a dealership. Most people who are buying a new car or a new to them car and they have an old car to get rid of, they will frequently just trade that car in to the dealership that they're buying the new car from because frankly, it's just easier. The dealership handles all the paperwork. You drive there in the old car. You drive home in the new car. Easy peasy. But the trade-off to that is you're making less money on your old car because the dealer is going to buy it from you at a trade-in price or a wholesale price. That's different from the retail price that they will eventually turn around and sell it for. And that's assuming that they're even going to keep your car to sell on their lot. If they don't like your car, they don't think they can sell it on their lot for whatever reason, they're just going to haul it off to the auction and sell it at a wholesale price there. In which case, the price they have offered you on trade is even lower than wholesale because they've got to cover their costs to take it to auction and estimate what they think they can sell it for. This is why you always make less money on your old vehicle if you sell it to a dealership. Some people would prefer to get the most money that they possibly can for their old car, or perhaps you're not buying a new car. You have an old car that you just want to sell outright. Maybe you're just moving or you don't need this third car, whatever reason. So selling it privately can get you more money or simply be the best option for you. However, there are some downsides and some challenges to selling your car privately. Yes, you will typically get more money, but there is a hassle factor and there are a few risks that you need to know about and know how to mitigate if you are going to sell it safely for yourself. The first thing I want to talk about is how do you get ready to sell your car? The first thing you need to do is make sure that you actually have the title to said car. Hopefully the title to your car is in a safe deposit box at the bank or in a fireproof box, you know, filed somewhere safely in your house and you have it readily at hand. You wouldn't believe how many people cannot find the title to their car. They think they have it, they know it somewhere, but for the life of them, they can't find it. So if you can't find the title to your car, you'll have to go to the DMV and get a new one. If you're in a hurry, most DMVs will have a location where you can do what's called a same-day title, and they can literally print it for you right there. You will pay extra for that, but it does get it to you today instead of having to wait a few weeks for them to mail it to you. So be sure you have the title in hand. If you still have a loan on your car that you have not paid off yet, then the bank is sitting on the title to your car. Ideally, if you have enough cash to pay it off and clear that lien and get the title from the bank, as well as be sure to have them send you a lien release document to prove that the loan has been released, you'll probably need that with the DMV. That's ideal. But if you're selling a car that you still owe like 20 grand on and you know, you're like me, you don't have 20 grand just sitting in the bank, you may not be able to do that. That doesn't mean you can't still sell your car privately. There's just going to be a few more hoops that you have to jump through. So if you're in that situation, call your bank, let them know, hey, I'm preparing to sell my car privately. I know you guys have the loan and the title to it. What is the process for then getting that paid off and then getting the title to the new buyer? Most banks will have a process that they will walk you through of logistically how this works. If the buyer is also getting a loan from his or her bank to buy the car, then the two banks will know how to work together and play musical money and musical titles. They will typically do the DMV paperwork for you because they want the lien holder recorded properly 
on the title application that the buyer fills out. If the lien is not recorded correctly, then the bank does not get the title to the car that they have just loaned a lot of money for. This makes them very unhappy. So in that situation, just work with both of the banks. They will know how to do it and they will walk you through it. I have personally done that myself way back in 2007 when I sold my Infiniti G35 Sport Coupe privately. It was that exact situation. The banks handled it beautifully and it made it super easy peasy for both me and the gentleman who bought my car. But make sure you just know what that process is. The next step is to clean up your vehicle. And you want to start with maintenance. Hopefully you have been listening to me preach for a while now and know how important it is to maintain your car while you own it, but also how that increases the value of your car when you go to sell it, whether you're selling it to a dealer or you're selling it to a private individual. Cars that have been well-maintained, and if you have the documentation to back that up, which you should because I also preach about keeping all of your records, those vehicles can be worth as much as $2,000 more to a buyer because you have the proof, hey, my car is in good shape. I have taken care of it. Therefore, it is much more likely to be reliable to the new owner and they will have to invest less money in maintenance, especially right up front, than they would if they're buying a car that has not been well cared for. It's a big risk to them. And if you've maintained your car and you have the paperwork to prove it, that mitigates that risk to them. And they are willing to pay more money for that car. Even dealers are. And this is especially true if your car is older and has higher miles. If it's been well-maintained, especially if it's something like a Honda or a Toyota that has a reputation for being reliable and therefore those cars are very much in demand on the secondary market, you'll be able to command top dollar for your vehicle. So get your maintenance records together. And if the car is due for anything, you know, make sure your maintenance is current. Obviously, if you have an older, higher mile car that has some issues, you know, maybe it's got a little bit of an oil leak, it's not going to be worth it to you most likely to spend $1,000, you know, replacing that rear main seal that's leaking slightly because you're not going to get that money back out of it when you sell it. I just believe in being completely honest when you advertise your car. If it has any known issues, and especially if you have those issues documented by your mechanic because he or she probably found them the last time you brought it in for an oil change, you know, show that to the people. Just be honest because that way, you know, that's your integrity. You know, you shouldn't be trying to screw over somebody else who's trying to buy your car because you wouldn't want to be treated that way when you're buying one. So, you know, be a good person, be totally honest with them and know that, yes, it's going to mean your vehicle is going to sell for a little bit less money, but it still may be worth something to that person anyway. It won't necessarily kill the value unless it's a huge major problem. You know, if the check engine light is on and you don't know why, yeah, it's going to be harder to sell that car. You at least need to know why that check engine light is on and be able to prove that to a prospective buyer. Even cars that have a lot of issues may still be worth something because you may find you know, a lower income person who just needs a cheap piece of transportation and maybe they have some mechanical skills or they are a mechanic and they're willing to put the work into it because they can do the labor themselves and that's worth it to them. You know, Your mechanic may want to buy it from you and turn around and sell it or keep it for themselves. Lots of mechanics do that. So even if your car is not mechanically in perfect condition, as long as you were honest and it's not something completely disastrous like needs new engine, <laughs> and even in those cases, sometimes you can still sell that stuff. You can sell just about anything on Craigslist these days. You just have to price it appropriately. And we'll talk about pricing in a few minutes. The next step is to clean your vehicle up. The appearance of your vehicle is vitally important because humans are naturally attracted to pretty things. You know, bright, shiny object syndrome. You know, you may personally overlook some dirt, some scratches, some stains, because this is your car. You see it every day. 
whether you believe you do or not, you have some level of emotional attachment to that car. So you tend to overlook these things because quite frankly, you've been overlooking them probably for years or at least several months if you've been driving the car in that condition anyway. But a prospective buyer is not going to have that same attachment to your vehicle, and they're going to be looking at it more critically. So you need to take a step back and look at your car from the perspective of a buyer. If you were walking up to this car thinking, oh, I might want to buy this, what are you going to see? Be really critical. That does not mean you have to fix everything and that it has to be in perfect condition, especially, again, if it's an older, higher mile car that's not going to be worth a huge amount of money anyway, It's not you're not going to get it back in perfect condition. However, if you put in a little bit of elbow grace and you clean it up as best you can, you know, go get some upholstery shampoo, scrub out any stains if you can, vacuum it really, really well clean and wax the outside as best you can. Maybe even get a little clay bar that might be able to get out some scratches. It's up to you how much elbow grease and time you're willing to invest in this. But the nicer your car looks, even if it's older, the more money you're going to be able to get for it. And I'll give you an example. I have a client right now who he is, I wish every single client I had maintained and took care of their cars as well as Norm does. He is amazing. He has every single record. He keeps a spreadsheet of all of his maintenance and cross-references that to the receipts and even puts feedback on how he liked the mechanic. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. He's a very detail-oriented person and I love him for it. But he has an old like 16, 17-year-old Toyota RAV4 that has over 300,000 miles on it. And I swear, this car looks dang near perfect. You walk up to it and you think the car maybe has 100,000 miles on it. Maybe. It is in such great condition. And he didn't spend a lot of money to clean it up because he just keeps his cars this way all the time. And this car looks so great. And because he has these records, you would think that, you know, a a near 20 year old car with over 300,000 miles wouldn't be worth squat, but he's actually going to be able to get some money for this car because it's going to continue to run for another hundred thousand miles if the next owner maintains it. And it is in such good shape cosmetically as well as mechanically. It's ridiculous. So use your judgment and clean up your car as best you can. The newer and lower mile and higher value your car is, the more you should put some effort into it to clean it up. It might be worth spending a couple hundred bucks to invest in a professional detail because they're going to have the the tools and equipment and experience to know how to get more stains out, get more scratches out of your car. If you've got some body damage to your car, it may be worth, you know, getting the dent wizard out there to pull some dings out, do a little bit of body work to it because you will be able to sell it for more money if it's a newer car. So obviously use your judgment to make sure that your car is in the best possible condition that it can be when you go to sell it. Because again, people like shiny, pretty, clean things. If, heaven forbid, you have smoked in your car, in which case, you know, just take a moment to smack yourself upside the head for me. (laughs) Again, do your best to clean it up. You're probably only going to be able to sell that car to another smoker because us non-smokers can smell that stuff a mile away and we won't touch your car. So, you know, it's worth it to invest in a good shampooing. Um, There's some chemicals. It's called a smoke bomb that you can do to try and get that smell out or at least minimize it. And then, you know, sell it to another smoker. But those are the types of things that you need to do to prepare your car. Also, be sure to get all of your crap out of there. You know, look in the nooks and crannies, you know, get all your your pennies and your quarters, get your sunglasses out of there. And most importantly, pull out any documentation, any paperwork that you may have kept in your car that has your personal information on it. You do not want that to end up in the hands of the next owner, or even someone who is just test driving your car. You want to protect your information as best you can. In terms of pricing your car, most people go out to Kelly Blue Book or whatever and pull prices off of there. 
I have preached this for a long time. Kelly Blue Book or any of those book values don't necessarily mean squat. They are more accurate today than they have been in the past. But just because Kelly Blue Book says your car is worth $7,000 doesn't mean your car is worth $7,000. There's so many other factors, and I'm not going to go into a lot of those details. I've covered some of them already. If you want more information on that, I did do a podcast on what is your car really worth. Go back and listen to that. But you just use that book value kind of as a, a starting point and realize there's going to be a range there. And, and Kelly Book has changed. They, they now do give you a range. But be sure you're looking at the private party range. You are not going to be able to command as high a price for your car as a dealership will. Dealer prices are always going to be higher because they do more to recondition the cars, typically. <laughs> And it is easier to get a bank loan on a dealer car than on a private party sale because the bank perceives the dealer sale to be less risky. And from their perspective, from a fraud and titling and control perspective, they're right. So private party prices are usually halfway in between dealer retail and trade-in or wholesale pricing. So be realistic about what you're going to get for your car. But don't just rely on whatever the book value says even if you look at several different values online, those are still just online values. You have to look at your local market for cars because what your car is worth is exactly what someone will hand you money for, not what some computer says that it's worth. So when you buy a house or you go to sell your house, an appraiser comes by and they do an appraisal on your house. They're not going to whatever the housing equivalent of Kelly Blue Book is. I'm not even sure that something exists. It probably does. They do what is called looking at comps. They look at the market and see what other houses that are similar to yours have sold for in the last several months to a year. You need to do the same thing. Go to Auto Trader, go on Craigslist, go to cars.com, look at cars that are the same year, make, model, and trim level, meaning they have the same bells and whistles, and similar mileage and condition to your car. And that'll give you a ballpark of what it's worth. You want to price it competitively for what it is, keeping in mind that it is private party, not dealer retail. So do that research, look at those comps, and leave a little bit of room for negotiating. People like to think they're getting a good deal. So, you know, especially private party, you know, they're going to offer you a little bit less. So give yourself at least a few hundred dollars worth of wiggle room, but don't price it so high that, you know, you've got a two or three thousand dollar markup because that's not real realistic. And you don't want to have to negotiate with private people like that anyway. But also don't price it too low. If a car is priced kind of under market value, at least a savvy buyer is going to look at that and go, what's wrong with this picture? It looks too good to be true. Meaning, okay, something is wrong with that car or it's a scam and that's a fake ad because those are out there. And I'll talk about that a little bit more after the break when I talk about avoiding the internet scams. So be sure, don't price it too high. Don't price it too low. You know, be the mama bear. It's just right. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to talk about being aware of internet scams, where you should list your car, how to handle the test drives, and how to do the paperwork once you find a buyer. I'll be right back after this. Do you hate car shopping? Do you worry about being taken advantage of or about finding the right car at a great price? Buying a car can be a frustrating and time-consuming experience. But what if you could get a great deal without having to do a ton of research, without having to haggle, and without the fear of buying a lemon? You can. As your personal car shopper, the Car Chick will help you pick the perfect car based on your unique lifestyle, budget, and personality. She'll handle all of the legwork and negotiating for you. All you have to do is sign the papers and take the keys. It's that easy. To learn how the Car Chick can save you time, money, and hassle on your next car purchase, give us a call at 704-248-8706. That's 704-248-8706. Or visit us on the web at thecarchick.com. Where the rubber meets the road. Nice to meet you. Love your asphalt. Hey, nice treads. It's Straight Shift with the Car Chick. 
Welcome back to The Straight Shift. We're talking about how to sell your car privately. Once you've got the car itself ready and figured out where you want to price it, now you need to decide where you want to list it for sale. There are a lot of different places online where you can list your car. Sure, you can still put a sign in it and stick it down on the corner, but that's a little old school. Everything is pretty much done online these days. My rule of thumb is if your car is worth $5,000 or less, stick it on Craigslist, stick it on Facebook, any of your free sites, but those are the big ones. But if your car is worth a little bit more money, you may want to go ahead and pay the, I think it's like, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks to list it on AutoTrader and or Cars.com or some of those sites. AutoTrader and Cars.com are the two biggest used car marketplaces. And that's where most people think to go. Those are the two that I primarily use when I'm shopping for cars. And when your car is worth a little bit more, paying to advertise it in one of those locations will attract a higher quality buyer, shall we say. You know, people that are shopping on Craigslist are usually looking for crazy bargains or they're looking for cheap stuff. You know, I've been selling a whole bunch of things out of my house as I've been cleaning out on Craigslist and that's where I go where I'm looking for a really good bargain. But when shopping for cars, you want to make sure that you are listing your car in the place where your target buyers are shopping. For example, if you have a more rare car, something that is hard to find but has a discerning buyer and maybe in high demand, maybe it's a sports car, maybe it's an exotic car, then you might want to list it on something like eBay or find a specialty site. Like if you're selling a Ferrari, go and see where people are buying Ferraris. There are definitely specialty sites for exotic cars that is going to be the better place to list it. You're never going to put a Ferrari on Craigslist. That would just be crazy. You would get so many idiots calling you. <laughs> so be sure you understand you know, what the marketplace is. But most people that are selling their Hondas and their Toyotas and their Fords and their Chevys are going to be looking at either something like Craigslist or AutoTrader and Cars.com. So that leads me to the downfall of listing anything online for sale, including cars, is that you now have to deal with a whole bunch of scammers. One of my hobbies is called scam baiting, and I work with an international group of folks that do this, and we purposely bait scammers using fake details in order to waste their time and waste their resources to identify accounts and money mules that they're using to launder money. We really are trying to hurt these scammers any way that we can, but there's very specific ways of doing that. And when you're listing something for sale online, you're putting your real life details out there, your name, your phone number, your contact information, and you never, ever, ever want to mess with a scammer when they're connected to your real life details because these scammers... It may seem funny to mess with them, but so many of these folks, especially the ones that are targeting car sellers, they are part of a very large organized crime rings around the world. These are seriously dangerous people. And even though they may be sitting somewhere on the other side of the world, they may have connections and probably do have connections in your area. And at best case, they could make your life miserable and steal your identity, but people have gotten killed. So if you are contacted by a scammer, just ignore them, block them, do not respond, and definitely do not mess with them. So here's a few things that you can expect to get. One of the things they do is they try to get you to verify that you're a real seller because they're so concerned that they're going to be talking to a scammer that they want you to verify that you're a real seller by confirming via Google Voice. This is complete and utter crap. What they are doing is they are trying to set up a Google Voice number that is a, a virtual phone number that you can use to make calls, do texting. They need these numbers in order to execute other scams they have going on. But to set up a Google Voice number, you have to have a valid, verifiable cell phone in the United States, which they don't have. So they are literally using you, trying to get you to hit verify when you get this text message from Google Voice. When you're doing that, you're actually setting up a Google Voice number for the scammer that they can then use to steal money from innocent people. So if anyone asks you to verify via Google Voice, just say no and never you know, block them, never talk to them again. 
These guys will usually contact you literally within seconds sometimes of you posting an ad on Craigslist. And they'll say, I saw your ad. I want to buy your item. Anyone who is contacting you in any way, shape, or form and saying immediately that they want to buy whatever it is you're selling, especially a car, without ever having seen it first or asking you any questions is definitely a scammer. So just ignore those idiots. The other big scam that car sellers need to be aware of is the scammer who is going to pull the fake check scam They'll contact you and say, oh, well, they were getting ready to buy this other car and that deal fell through, but they already have a certified check for this amount that's more than what you're asking for your car. Can they? And they're just going to send you this check and then have you wire them the difference. Or they're going to have you wire the difference to a, quote, shipping company or somebody else that's, quote, helping them. This is a scam. Those, quote, certified checks are actually counterfeit checks. In many cases, they're real. They've actually stolen checks because they have inside people at the banks. They've stolen checks on a certain bank and are counterfeiting them. And that check is not real. So you go to deposit it and then they want you to wire the difference to, you know, them, one of their money mules. And it looks like the check clears your bank because your bank has to make those funds available to you within 24 hours. It can take up to two weeks for them to actually figure out that that check is counterfeit and not real. And now they pull that money back out of your account. You've already wired hundreds of dollars to the quote shipper and you're out that money. Furthermore, simply by depositing that counterfeit counterfeit check, you have committed a federal crime. So do not fall for this check scam thing. And we'll talk about the right way to accept money for one of these cars in a minute. The third thing you need to watch out for when you list a car online is you'll probably get contacted by a whole bunch of companies that want to help you sell your car. Some of these are scams. Most of them are just, they're legitimate companies, but they want you, you know, to pay, you know, X number of dollars for them to help you sell your car and they don't actually do anything or they're wanting to buy your car at a wholesale price, which if you had wanted to do that, you would have sold it to a dealer in the first place. So you know, a lot of these companies will say they'll do it and, you know, ask for a hundred or two hundred dollars. Those are scammers. They're not actually going to do anything. So just ignore anyone who calls you who is not legitimately a real life human being who is actually interested in your vehicle. And here's how you qualify that, you know, ask them some questions, you know, what, you know, where are you located? You know, just get some real information from them and verify that they're a real person. Um, You know, if you get where they're calling from and get their full name, you know, you can Google stalk them and see if they're real. But you should always meet someone in person if they're looking to buy your car. Unless you're in the situation where you are selling a more rare car and it is someone who, you know, from across the country who's contacting you because they've been looking for one of these, you know, for the last six months and they're really interested in buying it you know, that's going to be a little bit of a different conversation. But ideally, if you're just selling your normal car, you're going to sell it to someone, you know, probably within a few hour radius of your location. When you meet them to do a test drive, you want to meet them in a public place because meeting a stranger it's just dangerous. You don't want to do that at your house. You know, I've had to do that with selling wine racks and other furniture that I've been selling on Craigslist. Um, but there are ways that you can do that. But with a vehicle, don't have them come to your home. Meet them somewhere like a grocery store parking lot or the shopping mall or the bank parking lot where there's probably an armed security guard to help protect you. Just someplace public. And ideally, you want to bring someone with you so that you're not alone, especially as women. The reality is the world is just a more dangerous place for us than it is for men, and you have to take those extra steps to protect yourself. You know, worst case, if you can't bring anyone with you, have a buddy who is on, you know, the other end of the phone that you can text and say, okay, I'm here, I'm meeting the person. You know, if I don't text you back within 20 minutes, call the police so that you have someone who is looking out for you. When you meet with the person, ask to see their driver's license and their insurance card before you let them test drive the car. That helps you to verify that they are who they say they are, unless they have a really good fake ID. And it also verifies they do have a legitimate driver's license and current insurance because you don't want them test driving your car if they don't have insurance because what happens if they wreck it on the test drive? That's their fault, not yours. So 
have them show you those documents and then be sure to go on the test drive with them. You know, even if you're selling a little two seater car and, you know, it's a couple and they both want to drive the car, that's great. They can do it, take turns doing that, but you should be with your car at all times. So doing that in a public place, verifying who they are, verifying they have insurance, that's going to help keep you and your car extra safe. When you get to the point where you have negotiated a mutually agreeable price and you're ready to finalize that transaction, there are a few steps involved. Number one, you need to have the right paperwork. At minimum, you need to have a buyer's order or a purchase order. And you can just Google one of those. Um, you know, you can reach out to me through my website, thecarchick.com. I have a canned one that I use, but you know what? I Googled it and made some modifications. So that just gives you both a piece of paper that says that you sold the car um, just for your own records. And you would both make two copies of that and sign both of them. And then you would each keep a copy. But the most important thing, obviously, to have the title to the car, you know, if you have the title in hand or go through whatever process with the bank, most titles have to be notarized. So it's best to do this whole final transaction at a bank and preferably the buyer's bank. That way, they can either get cash and give it to you, and that's really the best case scenario, you know, unless you're dealing in, you know, multi, multi thousands of dollars. If they, you know, less than $5,000, they should be able to give you cash. Or they can get a bank, certified bank check, but you're there with them and you're watching the teller create that check. You know the funds are available in their account and you know that it is a real check. So that's the best thing to do. Or they can have the teller wire the funds directly to your bank account. But either way, you know the funds are there, you're watching that happen, and you're not having to just kind of take their word for it that the funds are there, the check is good. Never just take anybody's word for that. The bank should also have a notary on staff that can notarize that title for you. And that makes everything a lot easier. And again, you're in a public place, so you're not meeting at a private home. A lot of DMV paperwork, you know, that DMV paperwork is the buyer's responsibility. However, my recommendation is to tell the buyer, hey, be sure that you bring all of the DMV paperwork you're going to need with you so that we can sign everything and fill it all out at the same time. A lot of DMVs will have a required odometer disclosure document and a damage disclosure document. Those are documents that you as the seller have to sign that says, yep, the odometer's right and nope, car's not a flood car or a salvage car. So the buyer needs to know ahead of time what documentation their state DMV requires and then bring that with them. Then you can just sign all the paperwork at the same time, make sure it's all correct. And then later on, when the buyer goes to the DMV to register the car, him or herself, they're not missing anything and then have to try to reconnect with you to get your signature on something after the fact, especially if they live further away. So it's just best to have all that together dealing cash if you can, or meet at their bank, have a certified check. If you can't meet at their bank because they bank at Podunk Credit Union, that there's not one in your location, then go to your bank. Your bank can sort of, you know, call their bank and make sure the check is good or they can bring cash and it's safer. Just do it at somebody's bank is the best bet. So that should help keep you safe, financially safe, and minimize the risk all around. Because it is a risk to the seller, or I mean the buyer too, to meet with a stranger. That way everybody feels comfortable. There are third-party institutions to kind of help facilitate the transfer of the money, fill out paperwork, notarize everything. And then you have sold your car and the buyer has hopefully gotten a new car and everybody is happy. So folks, that is how to sell your car privately to get the most money for it and to minimize the risk to yourself. Hope this was helpful. Until next time, drive safely, everyone. I'm out of here. The Straight Shift Podcast is copyright Leanne Shattuck, The Car Chick, 2017. All views expressed by guest and or co-hosts are those of the guest and or co-hosts, and not necessarily those of Leanne Shattuck or the car check.